Okay, Matthew 26, verses 26 to 29. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. He took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is the word of our Lord. Please be seated. And let's pray again together. Glorious God, as we approach your word this morning, Lord, we approach you prayerfully. Lord, asking that you would work in our hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit. That you would help us through the power of your Spirit to understand the full significance of what we are doing when we receive the Lord's Supper together. So Lord, we pray this asking earnestly that you would hear us, but Lord, we also pray this with confidence Trusting, Lord, that you are faithful and that you have given us this ordinance as a reminder of all that Christ has accomplished for us and also as a participation in the body and the blood of Christ. And so, Lord, as we remember these things this morning, I pray that you would shape our minds according to your word and the power of your spirit. And that these elements would preach to us as your word preaches to us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John chapter 6 tells us that now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. This was exactly one year before Christ's crucifixion. At the next Passover, the night before Jesus was crucified, he would introduce the Lord's Supper. But at this Passover, conflict with the Pharisees was heating up. They had just begun to seek to kill him, wrongfully accusing him of Sabbath breaking and of blasphemy for calling God his own father, John 5, 8. At the next Passover, they would succeed. As Jesus continued his healing ministry, not far away from Jerusalem, or now rather far away from Jerusalem, on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, a great crowd had gathered following him. And so he asked his disciples how they would provide food for such a multitude. All the food that they had access to was, was five, a boy's five barley loaves and two small fish. And you know what happened next. Jesus gave thanks for the food and began to distribute the food. And about 5,000 men plus women and children, so upwards of 20,000 people, ate their fill that day. And there were 12 baskets of food left over. And the people were amazed and they, they declared, this indeed is the prophet who has come into the world. And they wanted to take Jesus and make him king by force. But he withdrew alone and he went alone up to the Golan Heights. And he sent his disciples in a boat across to Capernaum, back on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So as they went across, Jesus was not with them, and a, a fierce storm blew down the deep valley and whipped the waves of the Sea of Galilee into a boiling frenzy. And the disciples had gotten as far as the, the middle of the lake, and they weren't making any headway. Now remember, many of these men were fishermen, and they knew these waters. This was their fishing territory. And they knew what could happen to them. But then they saw something through the gloom. They saw someone through the gloom. It was Jesus. If they were scared before, they were terrified now. Matthew and Mark tell us that 
This was where Peter walked on the water towards Jesus and that the water was calmed as, as soon as Jesus and Peter got into the boat. And then John tells us that immediately the boat was on the other side at Capernaum. And so the next day the crowds came looking for Jesus. And when they found him, they asked him when he'd gotten there. And so he told them, he responded, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. He continued, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. So they asked what works they needed to do in order to obey God. And so Jesus explained that the work of God was to believe in him whom God had sent. And they wanted a sign and, and mentioned the manna that, that their fathers had eaten in the wilderness, saying that, that he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus told them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And so they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus responded then with the first of his I am statements. He replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And so Jesus told them that, that, that those who the Father gives to him will indeed come to him, and that he would preserve their faith. But they grumbled. They didn't like Jesus' declaration that he was the bread from heaven, and, and then Jesus reiterated that they couldn't come to the Father unless, uh, couldn't come to him unless the Father who had sent him drew them. He said that whoever believes has eternal life. And then he said it again, I am the bread of life. Anyone who eats this bread will never die. And then Jesus turned up the heat. And the bread that I will give to you for, life is, for the life of the world is my flesh. And they were shocked, but Jesus continued, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is too true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. And this is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And the disciples too were shocked. And they grumbled among themselves. And Jesus knew what was going on in their hearts, so he asked them if they also were offended. At that point, many of Jesus' disciples walked away from him. And so Jesus asked the twelve whether they too would walk away. And Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus said that he had chosen them, but that one of them was a devil. Now this miracle, Jesus' miraculous feeding of the 5,000 is one of the best known miracles in the scriptures. It's one of the few miracles that is, is recorded in all four gospel accounts. Jesus' timing, as usual, is exquisite. Taking place at the time of the Passover, the most important Jewish holy day, when people were, were conscious of their deliverance, it was the Passover was a celebration of their deliverance out of captivity in Egypt. Also referred to as the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when people would abstain from, from all bread that had contained leaven. When people would, would, would even take that, all that bread with leaven out of their homes. So this time when, when bread was on their minds, on this bread-focused holy day, Jesus would perform this miracle that pointed to him as the bread of life. Eating the flesh 
Jesus said, to, told his, his people to do, it refers to coming to Jesus and putting your trust in him. And drinking his blood refers to trusting in his atoning death. Now, although in this, in this incident, when, when, Jesus, when Jesus fed the 5,000 and, and told people to, to eat his bread, eat the, his, his body and drink his blood, he was not referring directly to the Lord's Supper. This, this would not have been, they would not have understood this at this point because it would not yet be instituted. It would be another year before he would institute the Lord's Supper. Nonetheless, the link is obvious. Because in the Lord's Supper, we symbolically eat Jesus' flesh and drink Jesus' blood. And last week, as, as this was the, the first Sunday when we, we instituted a new practice that we're going to do as a church. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper every single week. The Lord's Supper is that important. We believe it's central to what we do when we gather together as the Lord's people on the Lord's day. Now, there are six elements that are a necessary part of participation in the Lord's Supper. Preparation, examination, commemoration, participation, celebration, and anticipation. I know last week I said I was going to look at five. I was, I was going to include participation as part of celebration, but I realized I need to focus on that one on its own and it's as its own category. Remember last week I spoke about preparation and examination and the necessity of preparation, the necessity of examination. You don't come to the Lord's Supper unprepared. I explained that you wouldn't go to a meal at Buckingham Palace unprepared. If you wouldn't do that, how much less should you gather together around the Lord's table unprepared? You prepare with prayer. Prayer for, for yourself, for your family, for the church. You pray for your own heart, for the, the hearts of, of your loved ones in your family and your loved ones in your church family. You prepare yourself during the week and, and especially the night before through, through conscious consideration of what we are about to do. And you prepare your family through conscious communication of what we are about to do. So you need to engage in preparation. You also need to ex engage in examination. Now again, this is not other examination. It is self-examination. Yes, pray for those in your life who, who you believe are walking in sin. Pray for... Pray that, the, the, that especially though, that, that in your heart, that, that, that the, Lord, the Holy Spirit would reveal to you where you are walking in sin. And that he would give you repentance. So yes, pray that for other people, but, but if you focus only on other people, then you are missing what this, this is as a means of grace in your own life. And so this idea of preparation is a, a key part of the proclamation of God's word. It's, it's meant to, to be like a searchlight that the Holy Spirit uses to shine into the dark places of your heart. So we preach the whole counsel of God's word. Those passages even that, that we sometimes feel a little squeamish about. Maybe that we maybe even unconsciously avoid because they, they make us feel uncomfortable. But the, the whole counsel of word through the power of the Holy Spirit shines God's light into these areas as well. So you, you examine yourself before partaking in the Lord's Supper. And then, then the, the, what you're doing is you're, you're preparing a way through the power of the Spirit for the, the gospel of Jesus Christ to come flooding in. So when we, when we examine ourselves, we make sure that we're not eating the bread or drinking the cup in an unworthy manner so that we're not guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Remember, th those who, who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment on themselves. Paul gave this instruction to the Corinthian church and, and many in the Corinthian church were, were sick and many even died because of the Lord's judgment on them for this. Because they were selfishly indulging without considering their brothers and their sisters. So we certainly need to consider the, the body of Christ, the people of Christ, when we come to the Lord's table. 
And in that, we, we think about the Lord's Supper as being part of our unification. That could have been its own heading as well. The unification of the body as we come together around the Lord's table. I'll talk a little bit about, more about that later. But it's no less significant that we need to consider not just the body of the church, but the body of Christ and also His blood when we participate in the Lord's table because this is ultimately what the Lord's table is for. So then, this morning, I want to focus on these two areas that we, that we really need to consider when we consider the Lord's table, that of commemoration and participation. These emblems, the, the bread and the cup, are, are there as a reminder. But what do they remind us of? Well, when the Lord instituted this, His supper, He said, he declared, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup was to be, to be drunk in remembrance of Christ. It's a reminder, a reminder of the body and the blood of Christ. It's a reminder then of his crucifixion. And I was meditating on this even as we, we sang just a few moments ago. But how before Jesus was led to, to, a, to the cross, Pilate had him scourged. He was disrobed and tied to a stake. A Roman soldier took a flagrum as a, a whip made of, of several leather thongs with, with bits of sharp metal and bone attached to cleave flesh from his back. They plucked out his beard. They spit in his face and beat him mercilessly. And then mockingly, they placed a crown of thorns on his head, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And then they struck his head, driving the inch-long thorns deep into his scalp. And then Pilate had him brought to the cross, where the soldiers laid him prostrate. And they took a wooden mallet and drove spikes through his wrists and his ankles as his nerve endings were mangled and the cross was raised vertically with ropes and then it dropped suddenly into the slot prepared for it and blinding white pain would have screamed through his mangled nerves and then arms extended, knees bent, his muscles would quickly begin to cramp Forced to push against the spikes in his wrists and ankles in order to breathe, he would slowly suffocate. And death would usually come over the course of several days as the, the victim's life ebbed out, lacking the strength to be able to support themselves to breathe. But not this time. Crucifixion was considered to be the most agonizing pain any human being could experience. But this was no mere human being. And this physical pain was not his most agonizing pain. Jesus was not experiencing just physical pain. He was experiencing the wrath of Almighty God. We esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted, Isaiah 54, 3. And that he was, for on the cross, the Father's wrath was poured out on him, and the blood of Christ was poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins, Matthew 26, 28. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief, Isaiah 53, 10. It was the will of the Father to crush his Son. God's perfect plan from eternity past was that the Christ would die in the place of his people. Peter declared in Acts 2.23, This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. 
God the Father put his son to grief for the sins of his people. The soul of Christ was an offering for their guilt. The soul of Christ was an offering for your guilt, brothers and sisters. He has borne your iniquity. Though sinless, Jesus was treated as a sinner, the worst sinner ever to walk the face of the earth because he bore the guilt of all of my sins and not just all of my sins, again, all, the, all of your sins and the sins for every one of his elect, past, present, and future. And then in the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land for three hours. The end was near. And then Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Labasabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This was the worst of the agony that Jesus experienced in his humanity, the separation from God. Something that you and I deserve for all eternity. The perfect Son of God in His flesh experienced in your place and my place. But the bystanders thought He was calling out to Elijah. And so they watched to see if Elijah would come and save him. And one took a sponge and, and filled it with, with vinegar and gave it to Jesus to drink. And then Jesus cried out again with a loud voice as he gave up his life. John tells us his words. It is finished. And the curtain in the temple that separated the Holy of Holies was, was torn in two from the top to the bottom. There was an earthquake and many tombs were opened and the bodies of saints who had died were, were resurrected. And now many people witnessed these things, but very few understood what was actually going on. The bread and the cup remind us of Christ's sacrifice for our sins. But that's not all they remind us of. They remind us also of Christ's entire life. They remind us of His incarnation, that the Son took on human flesh. They remind us also of His perfection, that at every moment Christ was, was working, with, that every moment Christ was perfectly loving the Heavenly Father and perfectly loving His neighbor. And the bread and the cup preach Christ better than I could ever preach Christ. The Lord's Supper is a sign. It is a, a symbol, a visible representation of the Word. Augustine called it a visible Word. So again, the, the Lord's Supper is celebrated not in, in separation from the Word, but in conjunction with the Word. But as a visible representation, the, the, the blood and the, of the blood and the body of Christ, it, it celebrates Christ again in a way that I could never preach it. Now we need to tread very carefully here. John Calvin warned that any man is deceived who thinks that anything more is conferred upon him through the sacraments than what is offered by God's word. And that the word is essential because the right administration of the sacrament cannot stand apart from the word. He said, for whatever benefit may come to us from the supper requires the word. Now I have a few quotes to, to work through here, so bear with me. What Calvin is saying here is that that the, the Lord's Supper does not, is, is not celebrated in isolation away from the Word, but again, it, it's tied to the Word, inexorably tied to the Word. Robert Bruce, not Robert the Bruce, but, but the Scottish reformer who is also the direct successor to John Knox described the Lord's Supper as a holy sign and seal that is annexed to the preached word of God to seal up and to confirm the truth contained in that same word. 
So what he's saying here is that, that the Lord's Supper seals the word like a wax seal on an important document. And Bruce continues, he said that, that as such, it persuades you better of the truth. It persuades, persuades you better of the truth. And so we say that again, that the Lord's Supper cannot function alone without the word. But maybe I can say it like this, that the, the Lord's Supper puts an exclamation mark on the word. Another quote from Robert Bruce. He says, you get a better grip of the same thing in the sacrament, we would use the term ordinance, than you got by the hearing of the word. The, the same thing he said that you possess by the hearing of the word, you now possess more fully. He said that God has more room in your soul through the receiving of the sacrament than you would otherwise have by hearing the word only. And he asked, what then? Is this a new thing we get? He said, no. We get Christ better than we did before. We get Christ better than we did before. We get the thing which we had more fully, that is, with more sure apprehension than we had before. We get a better grip of Christ now, for by the sacrament my faith is nourished. The bounds of my soul are enlarged, so that where I had but, but a little grip of Christ before, as it were, between my finger and my thumb, now I get him in my whole hand. And indeed, the more my faith grows, the better grip I get of Christ Jesus. Thus the sacrament is very necessary if only for the reason that we get Christ better and get a firmer grasp of him by the sacrament than we could have before. So again, we would affirm that the word is vitally important, that the word is, is, is really central, but, but, that the, but that the Lord's Supper really puts, again, an exclamation mark on the word. And so then the, the bread and the cup are a, a visual reminder of all that, Christ, all, all that God has done for us in Christ. But it is not a mere memorial, as so many wrongly teach. It's very common in, in Protestant churches today that, to, that, to, that the elements, that the, the bread and the cup are, are merely a memorial. This was the, the view of, of Huldrych Zwingli, the Swiss reformer and colleague of Martin Luther. Now Zwingli was right to distance himself from Luther's aberrant consubstantiation. This was, consubstantiation was a, a hybrid, really, of the, the Roman Catholic view and of the, and of the spiritual reality. Roman Catholics believed that the, the bread and the cup were, were mysteriously somehow transubstantiated or transformed into the actual body and blood of Jesus. That's heresy. Many of the Marian martyrs died because they would never affirm the lie of transubstantiation. But Luther tried to find kind of a middle ground and so he said that, that, that somehow the, the actual body and blood of Christ are present with the elements, the bread and the cup. This is, this is also heresy. This is that's consubstantiation. And so Zwingli was right to, to distance himself from that. But Zwingli really went too far in the other direction. And so in effect, he downplayed the significance and the effect of the Lord's Supper. And his error, that it's, it's, uh, again, uh, that it's a mere memorial, is, is really common in churches to this day. So then we need to ask, what is happening then when we partake in the, the Lord's Supper? Yes, it is a commemoration, but it's more than that. It's more than that. It is also a participation. Consider 1 Corinthians 10, verses 16 and 17. The cup of blessing that we bless, it is a participation in the blood of Christ. The bread that we bless, participation in the body of Christ. 
Because there was one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. Again, remember John 6 that we discussed earlier, where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. John 6, 35. And then he told his listeners, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Well, I found the Reformation Study Bible here helpful because it says that that Jesus' statement that he is the bread of life and that you must eat his flesh and drink his blood points to the spiritual reality that is signified by the supper. Again, like I said earlier, Jesus was not here directly referring to the Lord's Supper, but he was pointing to the same spiritual reality that the, that the bread and the cup represent. That of our union with Christ and the benefits of salvation that we have received through him. And so then partaking of these elements is nothing less than their participation in the body and the blood of Christ. This was Calvin's view. He said, I say then that, the that in the mystery of the supper, by the symbols of bread and wine, Christ, his body and his blood are truly exhibited to us, that in them he fulfilled all obedience in order to procure righteousness for us, that we might become one body with him. And secondly, that being made partakers of his substance, we might feel the results of this fact in the participation of all his blessings. And John Knox said it like this. He referred to the, the Lord's Supper as the spiritual nourishing of our souls with the graces and benefits of Jesus Christ. This is not a mere memorial. In order for us to participate in Christ through the bread and the cup, he must be spiritually present. Again, not physically present, that, like the Roman Catholics said, are almost spiritually present, almost physically present, rather, like, the, like Martin Luther said. His presence is spiritual, not physical. The 1689 London Baptist Confession says it like this. Worthy receivers outwardly partaking of the visible elements of this ordinance do them also inwardly by faith really and indeed not yet carnally or corporally but spiritually receive and feed upon Christ crucified and all the benefits of his death the body and blood of Christ being then not corporally or carnally but spiritually present to the faith of believers in that ordinance as the elements themselves are to their outward senses. So the 1689 is, is saying here that, that when we receive the Lord's Supper, that, that Jesus Christ is spiritually present. Now, we understand that, that, that God is, is omnipresent, that God is everywhere, always at the same time. However, in these elements, when the, when the church of Christ gathers together to receive the Lord's Supper, he is spiritually present in a unique way in the lives of believers, in their hearts. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. So then, when we participate in the Lord's Supper, again, we are participating in the body and the blood of Christ. And in this, then, the cup also remind the bread and the cup also remind us of our unification. We participate together. The, the Lord's Supper is a reminder of our unity in Christ. We eat and drink together, a visual reminder that we are in Christ together, that together we are in Christ. It's a reminder that we, that we do this as the body of Christ, as the people for whom Christ died, as the people who have been unified by Christ. Again, that's one of the reasons that the Lord's Supper, I believe, is central to what we do. Now, you can listen to sermons alone. You can pray alone. You can sing hymns and spiritual psalms, uh, songs alone. Now, I acknowledge fully that there's something special, something unique when the church gathers to do these things together. But there is no other time that you can participate in the Lord's Supper except when the church gathers 
together. The same holds true for baptism. You can't do this alone. Sinclair Ferguson, in his, his book, The Whole Christ, he actually refers to Robert Bruce. He says, The ministry of God's word, the, the mutual instruction believers give one another through singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, the encouragement believers give each other as they stir up one another to love and good works, all these are as divine ordinances, ways of promoting in us an increase of assurance that we are really Christ's. Since we love him, we love his word, and we love his people. Here, the ministry of baptism and the Lord's Supper play important roles. It says, of course, we do not get a different or a better Christ in the sacraments than we do in the Word, as Robert Bruce well said, but we may get the same Christ better with a firmer grasp of His grace through seeing, touching, feeling, and tasting, as well as hearing. Now, I, I, I hope and pray that, that, that as I proclaim God's word Sunday by Sunday, that the Holy Spirit is doing a work in your heart. In fact, I'm confident that the Holy Spirit will do a work in the hearts of his people. Whether it's conviction, whether it's, it's encouragement, or whether it's a sense of, of awe and wonder, at the gospel, I, I trust the Holy Spirit is, is doing these things in your heart. But I also trust that, that, that as these things are happening, that, that as the Holy Spirit is at work in the hearts of his people, that there is in you a desire to respond. A desire to, to somehow respond to, to God's word that has been proclaimed. Reformed pastor Kim Riddlebarger points out that, that more recently in church history that the altar call was introduced following the sermon, that it, it provided the congregation with an, with an opportunity to respond to God's word. And, and so he says the great irony is that the altar call functioned in many ways like the sacraments do in Reformed tradition. He goes on that while the Reformed understanding of the sacraments is firmly rooted in the teaching of the New Testament, the altar call is not. He said that God is aware of our weaknesses and our need to be reassured of our standing with Him. And so God promises that we are His in the gospel and He confirms His favor towards us through baptism and the Lord's Supper. And so Ritterbarger then continues. He says that the gospel is then both promised and made visible when the word is preached and when the sacraments are administered. That the sacraments, or as the Reformed people say, or the ordinances we would say as Baptists, that, that, they, that they give us as a church the opportunity to respond. They give us an opportunity to respond together as the people of God to what God has done for us in Christ. Yes, the elders preside over the table. But we are celebrating with you. It's something that we do together as one body. We are responding again together. It's not, again, as Riddlebarger says, as is common with altar calls, it's, it's not looking within our hearts to see whether, whether we really mean it. It's actually taking your eyes off yourself. When you celebrate the Lord's Supper, you are taking your eyes off yourself and you are putting your eyes on Christ. So it's not asking yourself whether you really mean it. But it's God's declaration. He who swears on his sovereign oath, as Rudolf Berger says, that God is saying, I really mean it. He's saying, I am your God, and you are my people. And God really means it. And that's what the Lord's Supper reminds us of through the power of the Holy Spirit. It reminds us of the, of the fact that we deserve God's wrath. We deserve to drink the cup of God's wrath, overflowing. 
That the, because of our sin, we deserve God's wrath to such an extent that even all of eternity could not extinguish it. But it's a reminder that Christ has drank God's wrath for you and for me. Christ drank the cup of God's wrath down to the dregs. He drank it all for his people. And so if we were to receive just an, even an empty cup from God, we would be most blessed. But in Christ, God does not give us an empty cup. He gives us instead a full cup, a cup that is overflowing with his blessings. And so next week, we're going to talk about what it means to, to celebrate the Lord's Supper together and what it means to, to anticipate the return of Christ as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. But, but let's, let's consider again. Let's consider again more fully what it means when the church gathers together. with hearts prepared by the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit examining ourselves, through the power of the Spirit commemorating what Christ has done for us, through the power of the Spirit participating in Christ, with eager, celebrating with, with eager anticipation for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let's pray together. A glorious God, we praise you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We praise you for your plan in eternity past that God the Son would take on human flesh and dwell in the midst of a sinful creation. that he would completely and perfectly love you, Heavenly Father. That he would completely and perfectly love, love his neighbor as himself and that he would love you and love his neighbor so much that he would go to the cross to bear your wrath, the wrath that we deserve not just that we deserved, but that we still deserve. We need the gospel every day. We need this reminder that you have given us of the gospel, Lord Jesus, in this ordinance of the Lord's Supper. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, as we participate in eating the bread and drinking the cup that we would mysteriously participate in the body and the blood of Christ. Not in any way that earns our salvation, but because our salvation has been earned by Christ for us. In whose name we pray, amen.